Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, July 12, 2018. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank you guys and girls for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I am humbled by your presence, so thank you for coming today. All right, what are we talking about? Well, obviously, as usual, current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, a couple things. Uh, as far as questions, if you don't mind, keep your questions relative to the slides. And then towards the end of the presentation, we can look at questions in general. Your stock picks, hold off on your stock picks towards the end, too, so make sure I don't look over them. And also, and this is also for your benefit, ask about one stock at a time and then hit return. That way I'll know which ones I've covered and which ones that I have. And this week's focus is based on a question I received. And it's sort of becoming something a little bit bigger quickly. But how to trade Forex, indices, and other in, oops, I had a mistake here, and other efficient markets is what that should read. All right, before we get into all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So I received this question from Kevin from New Zealand, and he said, have just watched the video below highlighted, which is a Metastock webinar that I did a while back. Also, a couple of others and received a few of your emails with further information. I've also subscribed to Metastock and have been trying out some of your templates. But before I get into watching other videos, could you please tell me if your templates work in Forex currencies? as this is what I trade. The quick answer to that is yes, and we have a very long-winded answer, as you'll see over the next few minutes. So yes, use, I usually talk about my ground rules when I'm doing a webinar, and this is where I discuss a couple of things. One, that patterns are fractal. In other words, they work at different time frames, and that markets are markets. So before we get into answering his question, let's talk a little bit about efficiency and inefficiencies in markets. I prefer stocks in general, but I do trade Forex. Since Forex is more efficient, I prefer looking for hourly bow ties off of major highs and lows. Now, as I've written about quite a bit, especially like in the now column that I do, sometimes you have to take a few stabs at it. Now, from a psychological standpoint, that could be pretty tough. It kind of feels like the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. But eventually, not always, but eventually you seem to catch some really nice trends. Now, keep in mind that my method is discretionary in answering this gentleman's question. So the bow ties might not always be perfect. But in an ideal situation, you want them to be tight. In other words, only several days in the crossing and fairly obvious. And we'll flesh that out in just one second. And I went on to say that I'm currently long the Aussie versus U.S. dollar and GBP versus U.S. dollar off of this pattern. And we'll get to that in one second. Before we get to all that, as I said a second ago, markets are markets. Provided that you have a large enough sample, a large enough group for a representative sample, Human nature is human nature. I was in Asia a couple of years ago, and I was approached by a gentleman who, in probably the best way to put it bluntly, would be wanting me to help him manipulate a very, very, very thin stock. Well, yes, that market is inefficient, but it's also didn't have enough participants or, or a representative sample to make technical analysis work. So let's back up to the definition of technical analysis that I like to use, or I agree, or that I use in my courses, is reading the emotions of the market participants. That's all technical analysis is. And I'm not talking about some kind of mumbo jumbo wave count or numer numerology or something, easy for me to say. But what I am talking about is looking at the psychology of what the participants have done 
And at the same time, you have to embrace your own emotions. Now, usually that's a segue into trading psychology, which we won't get into today. But just know that I've obviously covered this topic ad nauseum. But the bottom line is, with technical analysis, you're reading the emotions of others and seeing what they have done or might be likely to do next through the charts. Now, regarding efficiency, let's go back a little bit and talk about an excerpt from The Lost Art of Stock Selection. And this was in Trading Full Circle. I Several years ago, I started working on a book called The Lost Art of Stock Selection. And like everything I do, it always turns into a big, massive project. And I worked on it here and there as time allows and had it pretty much roughed out. And I receive a phone call from Greg Morris, and he says, look, I got a major publisher, and he's looking for books. And I told him that you would be a good person to talk to. And I thank Greg, of course, profusely for that. And I began talking to the publisher, and I said, well, here's the deal. I think the stock picker is a dying breed, and the stock picker seeks out these inefficient markets and these inefficient stocks, and that's where the real opportunity is. And I received a reply back from the publisher, a major publisher, I might add. And he says, hi, Dave, I met with the publishing division earlier this week about your book idea. Unfortunately, they don't think this book would be successful. Stock picking, as you rightly pointed out, is a dying art. This means not as many people will purchase the book on this topic. I don't agree with their assessment, but after making my case, they did not change their position. I'm sorry to have to give you this bad news. I appreciate your efforts and time in bringing this proposal to me. So that just further, further emphasizes my case that the stock picker is a dying breed. Now let's back up a little bit and get, let's talk about efficiency. Efficient market hypothesis states that everything is priced into a market. So you are foolish to think that you can beat the market and they are right to some extent when it comes to very efficient stocks. The theory comes apart with less efficient stock. A solar stock with the promise of solving the world's energy crisis doubles over a few days. A biotech with the promise of curing a hard disease makes a similar move. These markets are not efficient. The large potential price moves were not priced in. A great example of an inefficient market over the last several years has been the IPO market. There's been this great bull market in IPOs. If you go in and look at some of the IPOs that I mentioned lately on, or recently I should say, my Landry list, some of them have just taken off tremendously. And a lot of them come right back in. But it shows with a little money management how these inefficient markets can offer tremendous opportunities because those inefficient moves have not been priced in. Now, as I talk about when I talked about the IPOs, it does not necessarily have to be some technological revelation that will solve the world's problems. It could be burritos, movie delivery, or even comfortable yoga clothes for guys like Big Dave who eat too many burritos. So these smaller yet to be discovered companies are more efficient. So how important is inefficiency? Now, this is a data chart that, as I mentioned a second ago, there's been quite a few IPOs in fairly recent times that were on the radar that have just had these tremendous moves. So it's not just some stock from several years back. But here's a case where this little solar stock went up over 700% over a relatively short period of time, over about a year. That's a pretty good trade. Now, as I explained in the excerpts of the book that I gave this publisher, the gravitation toward derivative products increases inefficiencies in stocks. So you've got all these ETFs, and options, and all these other derivatives out there. 
And this is going to be especially true with the smaller cap issues. And I believe that if the present trend condition continues, and it has, and I probably wrote that about five years ago, the stock picker will be met with amazing success. You're going to be playing in a less crowded playing field. You will be able to exploit these inefficiencies as more and more are being created. Now, here's the clincher, though. Everybody and their brother wants to trade E-minis or just do a little ETF things and go about their lives. Well, this great fortune will not come without willingness to work. You have to learn how to read charts, recognize reoccurring patterns, and pick the best of the best stocks. You will have to look at charts and lots of charts. And as I often say, although it's a lot of work for me, it's really like being on a treasure hunt. Now, getting back to Forex and other efficient markets, in addition to seeking out inefficient markets, you can also seek out inefficiencies in efficient markets. Now, this is not my bread and butter, but it's something that I enjoy doing and I think that is worth doing as a trader. The bottom line is there's going to be fewer opportunities. And as we get towards the end of this presentation, I'll show you why that is, at least the way I like to do it. So it will also take an extreme amount of patience. You have to wait and wait and wait and wait. I have been docked with inactivity fees in accounts where I make trades based on inefficient moves and efficient markets. And again, that'll make sense in a minute. Nevertheless, even though there's going to be fewer opportunities and you're going to, it's going to require a lot of patience waiting for those opportunities, I still think it's a very worthwhile venture. And again, this isn't your bread and butter. You're not going to capture a 700% move in a little solar stock or a 200% move in a little IPO, but you'll still make a little money here and there, and sometimes more than just a little, if you capture a fairly sizable, inefficient move as it develops. Now, if you look at this chart relative to stocks, but it could be other markets too, and I'll explain why. But if you have large cap stocks, that are known, common names, household names, as a general statement, they tend to be efficient. They tend to be lower in volatility stocks, and they actually have, and I hate to say the F word, but they actually have fundamentals, okay? Now, the more inefficient a stock is, the more that the stock trades on emotions alone, okay? And that's the beauty of it okay of trading inefficient stocks is that they do tend to trade on emotions alone and a great example of that would be the ipos well i named my ipo course trade hot ipos dash the promise of the future now i went into a lot of details of the course where sometimes i promise and quite often more often than not i should say does not materialize but that excitement about that potential is what drives the stock higher. It's not the reality of some hum tremendous amount of earnings they make from whatever that little biotech discovery is or new energy discovery or new burrito discovery is. It's more the excitement over that. And there's a lot of different patterns that occur within IPOs because of this inefficient, I guess, frontier might be a way of putting it. Now, inefficient stocks, Again, they tend to be more smaller cap, more less unknown. And the example I often give is PepsiCo versus Sky People Fruit Juice. Well, I've never really heard of Sky People Fruit Juice until I started putting together these pre presentations. So the more unknown a stock, the more inefficient it may be. Now, just because a stock is inefficient doesn't mean you want to run out and trade it. You still want to go through a very rigorous stock selection process to find the best stocks there are. Inefficient stocks, as Jill Stavitz said, be higher in volatility, and again, they have very little fundamentals, if any.
Okay, didn't Greg Morris buy funds, ETFs, or indexes and not individual stocks for his funds? Yes, Greg was running $5 billion, okay? If you want to go out and try to be a stock picker running $5 billion, it's going to be very tough to flesh out those inefficiencies. So his shtick was the market timing and asset class timing more than obviously being a stock picker. Uh, what's his name? His name escapes me at the second. It'll, it'll come Peter... Peter something from Magellan Fund. Years and years ago, he was a stock picker, but it reached a point, you know, he was looking at little companies that were doing very, very things. He was very interested in them, but he's trying to run a multi-billion dollar fund. And he reaches a point where he can no longer become, no longer be a stock picker because these little bitty companies are just too small to make a, a material difference in the fund. And that goes back many, many years as far as that's uh, concerned. But anyway, yes, that's why Greg was uh, not a stock picker because he was running so much money. You can't, you can't run, and that's the beauty that we have as small private traders. As I've said before, sometimes in a trading service, I'll put an IPO in there and it'll take off and I'll feel pretty good. I'll get a, an email from a CTA, not a CTA, what do you call those things, an RIA, I was a CTA for 14 years, a uh, commodity trading advisor. An RIA is a registered investment advisor. And they'll say, hey, Dave, I like that little IPO, but I couldn't use it for my clients because it was too thin. So that's where the small private investor has an advantage. We're not handcuffed to only these big, stodgy, fat, blue chip stocks, so to speak. Okay. Peter Lynch, thank you, Frenchie, and everybody else who's typing in. I appreciate it, yeah. Now, what's efficient? Well, as I said a few minutes ago, large cap stocks, especially brick and mortar type of stocks, for instance, banks, large manufacturing companies, these type of companies have some sort of tangible assets or some sort of tangible type of balance sheet. And they often have a lot of analysts and a lot of traders that, are, that tend to cancel each other out. Now, if you look to trade off of major highs and lows and take some sort of transitional pattern, such as a bow tie or first thrust, then sometimes you can capture some inefficient moves, even in these efficient stocks and markets. And what I'm going to show you in just one second, as I mentioned earlier, is trading hourly bow ties off of major highs and major lows. Obviously, indices can be very efficient because there's hedgers, there's derivatives on them, and a lot of these things tend to cancel themselves out and make for very choppy markets. I learned very quickly when I was doing all my little trend following research, writing all these systems morning, noon, and night, that it was very hard to make something work on S&P futures. I could not make trend following work. Well, I didn't know it at the time. Well, now I do that that market is very efficient and choppy. You take a longer term view and it's like, oh, it looks like it just goes up. Well, it does, but there's a lot of zigs and zags in between. It doesn't always go up. Let me rewind that. If you were looking at it back then, it looked like it always went up. But there are periods of time where it might take 25 years or more for an index to make a new high. I don't want to – the argument there is I've gotten in a few arguments at uh, cocktail parties over that. <laughs> people don't believe me. And uh, you'd be surprised how many people don't realize that sometimes it might take – 25 years or more for an index to make new highs. But if you don't believe me, go in and play with your charts. Go back to the 1800s, late 1800s, and look at that. Forex can be very efficient. Why? Well, there's a lot of players. You've got a lot of people trying to play the currencies. And then on top of that, you've got central banks, you've got governments, 
and just a lot, a lot of people out there. Another example would be commodity futures, okay? And just kind of thinking off the top of my head, let's talk about gold for a second. Well, gold, you have people that might be doing some hedging with gold. You have people that might be hoarding gold. You have people that might be manufacturing gold, or I guess, what would you call it? Mining gold. And it's like, okay, well, we're mining all this gold. Let's sell gold in the future because we know we're going to dig some out the ground, but we need that money now. So let's sell those futures. If we get the gold out, then it all kind of balances out. So a lot of hedging and all types of speculation going on in a market like that. You also might have somebody, you might have jewelers or whatever who are looking to acquire gold and maybe that they're looking to acquire gold at a certain month so they can make the jewelry. So they might buy futures to lock in their price. So the point is, it's a very crowded playing field. Now, patterns or fractal. What works in one time frame or occurs in one time frame occurs in others. Now, I know I've kind of beat the dead horse on this, but if you look at the S&P 500 or any other major index for that matter, or any market in the world if you want, on a weekly basis and look at the major buy and sell signals, and major meaning coming off of all-time highs or at least multi-year highs, and you'll see that there's been some pretty good sell signals along the way. The last two bear markets started with a major sell. And then, as you know, back here, back in 1516, the market was pretty abysmal. Well, it didn't implode and lose half of its value like here and here, okay? But it did make a substantial move lower. And if memory serves, I think the Russell 2000 lost 18%. And the media defines a bear market at 20%. So for all intents and purposes... The last major sell in the Russell 2000 was a bear market. Now, there were major buys along the way. It was a very clean major buy in 2003. This one was a little sloppy, and I'll talk about sloppy bow ties in just one second. But it was a major buy nonetheless. And then after that major sell, there was a minor buy when the market turned right back up after that correction. Now, I just Googled, or whatever you call it, I did a, did a search on my computer for bow ties, and this stock came up. I don't remember why we were talking about this particular stock, but you can see it did make a weekly bow tie, and I'm sure on a daily basis it bow tied a lot sooner than that, given the sideways action after a big trend. But you can see there's a weekly bow tie. We just like looked at a weekly bow tie on the indices. Now, if you drill down to an hourly chart, one of the fascinating things here is you will have these major bow tie cells coming off of all-time highs. Now, not, not everyone turns into the mother of all tops like this one will, but as you can see, it pays to play for when they do. So this was a chart that I sent to Proactive Advisor magazine to talk about the bow ties and then how they are fractal and occur in different time frames. And this was the all-time highs that we saw earlier this year in the S&P 500. And then this was an hourly bow tie sell off of that pattern and this is exactly what we're going to look to do in the forex markets or exactly what i do and we'll show you in just one second now when you're looking to trade an efficient market what you want to do is you want to seek out patterns that would capitalize on the fact that the market is efficient something that would catch people off guard thereby creating an inefficient move. I'm getting a text that the charts 
have stopped updating. Well, let's just keep going and see if it eventually catches up. Okay. We had this problem last week. I wonder if I stop sharing and start again. Talk amongst yourselves. Well, hopefully it'll catch up. There it is. Okay, it's catching up. It's just slow. Yeah, it's going to be slow to catch up. The good news is the recordings are much more uh, robust, so it'll eventually catch up with the recordings. So if we take a look at a recent trade that I mentioned to this gentleman in the Aussie dollar, you'll see that there was a bow tie on an hourly basis and here was the buy. This is coming off of major, major lows, and we'll get to those in just one second. And if you be patient, the charts will catch up. My apologies on that. I don't know what the problem is again this week. So your actual buy was here. You can see this green line here is where I actually got in. I did get in a little late for whatever reasons. I tend to be a little bit more liberal on my entries because – in these markets because sometimes you can get triggered into a false move. But anyway, that would be the hourly bow tie off a major low. Now, if you look at the GBP versus USD on a daily basis, you could see that we had a major low down here. Once you reach that major low, then start looking for hourly bow ties off of the lows, okay? So Kevin went on to say, in the videos watched, there has been no mention of Forex at all. I have attached a couple of charts and would like your opinion slash comments on them. Both have comments on them. By comments, he means his comments. Yeah, the screens should be coming up, but it looks like there's a tremendous lag again this week for whatever reason, okay? So just sit tight on that. And the recordings are very robust, so you will see it in the recordings. And just try to think back <laughs> three slides. Okay, in this chart, he says, or where I have highlighted yellow bow ties. And the answer to his question is yes I know in the videos you say that it should be traded off a of major highs or lows and that is correct so here in this particular market which is a GBP this was a major low and it was a major low on the daily chart and beyond and then yes he is correct that is a bow tie. It took a few days to form. It's not a perfectly tight bow tie, but it's a bow tie nonetheless. And then your buy signal would be after a lower low and a lower high, so you trigger in somewhere in here. Now, once you're triggered in, because we're trying to capture a major, major, major low through the hourly chart, what I like to do is be willing to put in a stop below and sometimes give it a little bit more wiggle room below that major low. And it could be a little scary because sometimes like in this particular case, it'll go up then come down and then begin to ultimately take off. So he asked if this was a bow tie here and the answer is yes, but this is a minor signal because this is only off of multi hour highs or multi day highs. Okay. So your major signal is still working, as I've said before, until and unless the market goes on to make new lows, okay? So that would be a minor signal. And then, as I've said before, sometimes you'll have these signals, even though you're long, you might have a, a signal going the other way. That doesn't mean you should bail out. We are not trading a system based on buy and sell signals. We are trading a system based on buy signals 
and using stops, and then we're trading a system based on sell si signals or short signals and using stops. Once we're into a position, we do not get out pattern base, we get out on stop base. Now we could use the pattern to help us determine where the stop should go. The point is that maybe it's volatility, maybe it's pattern, maybe it's a combination of both on where we set the stop, but we're not going to exit the trade based on a signal against us, okay? And then, as you can see here, we did have a minor signal back in the direction of the major signal. Now, one thing I'm kind of toying with, and the beauty of teaching, and one reason I love to teach so much, is that you learn through teaching. You learn in the process. And one thing I've been really looking at lately is like, well, maybe these minor signals, especially after they occur after major signals, might be worth trading and if you're in a very inefficient market sometimes you can go in if you miss the first signal maybe take the next minor signal in the direction of that major signal now he was asking some questions on this particular market which is gbp usd daily great is the is the pound versus the dollar daily so he says right here, bow tie too choppy. Well, it's a little sloppy, but it's not coming off of major, major lows, okay? Here it is. It's coming off of multi-year highs, and you've got a pretty tight bow tie. Now, unfortunately, you really don't have a clean entry on the bow tie until you're way over here on the daily chart, okay? Now, you do have a first thrust type of setup right in here. And as I often say, you want to look for that first thrust first as opposed to waiting for that bow tie to form, which might occur much later. Now, I'm not trading the daily bow tie, though, but what I'm doing is I'm looking for hourly bow ties off of major highs. So in a case like this, somewhere around here or somewhere around here, I would be looking to trade an hourly bow tie in order to capture possibly a bigger picture new emerging trend. I'm not trying to capture a top. I'm trying to capture a bigger picture emerging trend. And I am, I'm not fighting the trend, but I'm trading in the direction of the potential new emerging trend. And I wait for that hourly chart to actually turn first. So I didn't trade the pound back then, but I did short the euro, and once it starts making major highs like it has in here, you look to start shorting on that hourly bow tie. Now, if memory serves, I did take a couple stabs at it, as I said earlier, and it will feel like beating your head against the wall and an exercise of futility. However, if you stick with it, eventually you're going to capture this. And this is worth the hassle of this. And again, as I said earlier, if you're willing to stop out well above those prior highs, then it's really worth your while. You'll probably have fewer trades and eventually will capture the mother of all moves. So let's take a look at, I think this is the British pound coming off of these multi year lows. Yeah, there's your major low. And keep in mind, this is an hourly chart. And there's a fairly clean bow tie here. And the buy signal was here. You see that little green line? That's where I actually got in. I got in a little bit late on this trade. And I don't remember exactly why. I don't think I was waiting for confirmation. I just think I just sort of missed it and realized I should be long and had to make the decision to either be long or let it go. And I decided to be long. 
Now, outside of what we're talking about today, he also asked me about bow ties on this chart. And the first thing that jumps out at me, and if you go in and watch, and I think it's in the first four videos of Trading Full Circle, which you can get for free. And I'll give you a link to that in just one second. But the first thing jumps out at me is that these are more than likely the wrong moving averages. Notice how the moving average does this, and then it does this, and then it does this. It's like they're, you can tell they're really slow to roll over, okay? And with, as I've preached quite a bit in those aforementioned first videos, when a you have an exponential moving average and price crosses below it, let's say price was up here, and then it crosses below it, that moving average will turn down on that day that it crosses, the first day that it crosses, okay, for an exponential moving average. And as I've said quite a bit, I owe Greg Morris for teaching me that. So if you were to go in and look at this on an hourly chart, which I think the prior chart, or I have in, in one of my upcoming charts, there is a bow tie here, but because he's using the wrong moving averages, it's really easy to do. If you don't put in, it depends on your charting package, but if you don't put in the E or the EMA, you end up with the wrong moving averages. So it's pretty obvious to me that these, again, are the wrong moving averages. So that's a simple fix to that particular problem. Now, how do you go about finding inefficient Forex trades. And I'm going to pause for a minute to see if things catch up. So, what I have discovered by accident is a really simple way to find these trades, at least in the major currencies, without much work. If you go to Finviz and click on Forex and then click on Charts, it gives you this little chart grid and what I like about it is you can immediately see what markets are hitting new highs, what markets are hitting new lows, and what markets are somewhere in between. Now I like to take it one step further and I like to take a look at the weekly charts, okay? So based on that, remember I showed you I was shorting the euro earlier this year? Well, why was that? Well, look on the weekly chart. It's making these multi-year highs so at this particular juncture, again, you would look for those hourly bow ties. Now, I didn't short the pound and the euro. I just shorted the euro. But as you can see, after all-time highs, excuse me, not all-time highs, nowhere near all-time highs, but after multi-year highs, you can then look to trade hourly bow ties. Now, where would an opportunity, potential opportunity be now? I'm glad you asked. Well, take a look at the dollar yen. You can see it's coming up on these multi-year highs. So especially if it takes out all these prior highs in here, it gets way up here, it might offer a shorting opportunity. Where else? Well, what did I tell you? I was just long. I'm long the Aussie dollar. Why? Well, look at it way down here at these multi-year lows. Now, but Dave, it looks like you're trying to catch a bottom. No, no, no. Pay attention. I'm looking for an hourly turn on the chart. I might be wrong a few times, okay? But I'm going to have a stop down here. And again, I'm looking at an hourly chart. So the hourly chart might look like something like this, okay? Imagine that's an hourly chart. Or we could back up a couple slides that I'll show you. And I'm willing to stop out down here. Now, this risk here is not a whole lot. When you think about the potential to capture the mother of all moves higher. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. We're not picking a bottom. So what other markets based on this will we be looking at? Well, take a look at the NZD USD. So this could possibly set up soon on the long side. Now, I'm already long the GBP right now based on an hourly bow tie. I'm already long the AUD. OK, so what's the denominator in these two? U.S. dollar. So I'm looking for a lower dollar in these cases. So I don't know if I'm going to go after the NZD too. Now, if these start hitting the profit targets, which so far they've, I don't want to say they failed miserably. They just haven't paid off. They've been back and forth in between profitability and none. But if they do begin to pay off and I do begin scaling out, then I might look to possibly add 
and the NZD. So again, this is just FinViz. This is on the free section of their site, which is uh, pretty cool because it gives me a quick graphic representation of what it should do. One more point, as I said earlier, okay, the you might wait a long, long, long time. This yen might take weeks, months, or even years before it bangs out some new highs and then you want to start to look to short it, okay? This euro took a long, long time to get up here. If memory serves, I think I was shorting a little bit back here too. So there will be times where you don't do anything. And as I said earlier, sometimes I actually get hit with a, an, a fee, an, an activity fee for not trading because I'm waiting. All right, any questions on all that? Okay, we'll get to the, your question on rising rates soon, okay? Self-publish your stock picker's book. You have a market. Well, yeah, I, I'll do that someday. Okay, very difficult with such huge lag, nothing making sense. Yeah, it will in recording, so my apologies on that. But thanks to you guys and girls who stuck with this frustration. Now, just real quick, uh, in case you're wondering what I've been working on, and I showed this last week, so I'll, I'll go pretty quick, I promise, this week. I'm working on this learning management system. And if you come to this screen here and you go over to, let's say, the courses, and let's say let's come down here to the, these are going to be the members' courses down here. These are the premium courses, which obviously are for sale now on my website. But what I'm going to do is, as long as you stay a member, I'm going to start unlocking these courses on here, up here. So eventually you'll have all the premium and all the members' courses. The premium courses are a little bit more intense whereas the members' courses are a little bit more spread out. But if we go to, like, for instance, methodology, what's cool about the learning management system is we can see your progress over here. And as I've said, at nauseam, I had one guy in particular, and he probably thinks I'm picking on him. There's more than one. But I had a guy email me for 10 years, and he would tell me every time he had a losing trade, which was quite often. I don't remember him ever telling me he had a winning trade. And he just didn't understand the methodology. And it was making me a little crazy. And I began to one, I began to wonder, is this guy mentally challenged? Well, come to find out, one day I kind of questioned his IQ. And I said, you know, this is really all in that first book I wrote many, many years ago, way back in 2000. Why don't you reread that and get back to me? And then he said, well, I've been meaning to get that. So obviously he made no attempt whatsoever to learn the methodology in the meantime lost a lot of money so this is where the learning management system comes in so if somebody sends me a question on let's say money management and i look at their progress and say well wait a minute you just kind of scratched the surface here let me give you a quick answer or we'll answer it in the next q a session but you really need to finish this money management course. And my goal is to empower you to be able to make your own decisions, informed decisions when it comes to trading. Now, getting back to the homepage, there's some things that I'm adding into this, like 911 calls. And that's like, if you are, you feel like you're stuck at something and you need some immediate help. Now, keep in mind, I'm not allowed to give direct trading advice. I'm no longer registered as anything. But what I could do is maybe look at your original plan and then we could figure out why you're not following your original plan. And then also here we're going to do private consultation. And then what will happen is as you remain a member, this is my kind of vision with this, I'll begin to open up some bonuses. So within the first month or so, You'll get access to the books, and then you'll start getting access to me and 911 calls and other things such as, what else? Oh, the, the courses. Okay. Um, 
we're going to get to that question in just one second, so sit tight. Uh, if you're interested, I will often refer back to those first four videos at Trading Full Circle. There's just a lot of good information there, if I say so myself. So if you go to this long, stupid URL that I've created, not sure why, I think it's the way WordPress made it, you could get those first four videos from Trading Full Circle. And you'll notice a lot of my presentations come from that course. Now, let's answer this question, and then we're going to hop into the individual stocks. And uh, before we do all that, we'll also take a look at the indices and sub sectors. Now, let's, let's get this question. Let's go ahead and get this question out of the way. Let's see if I can find my charts. So the question is, so rates have started, so rising rates have started, when does a recession six to 18 months start? Okay. I, as I say every week, if you go to davelander.com slash books dash to dash read, you'll notice in that list, I have intermarket technical analysis by John Murphy. I strongly urge you to read that book, but then, as I have said ad nauseum, you have to be careful, just as Murphy has said, who wrote the book on it, because intermarket technical analysis can have long lead and lag cycles. Pring has done a lot of work, too, and it might be, I think I've got some Pring books also on my website, but let me see if I get a blank screen. Here's the problem with that big picture analysis, okay? So I think Pring does a really good, he's got some really good economic charts, and you might be able to just Google and find them. But you've got like, let's say stocks are like up here rising. Well, rates might, well, let's just call them bonds so it makes sense. Well, bonds might do this, and stocks might rise another year or two, okay? Or bonds could, of course, turn right back up, and stocks could go right back up. So I think it's good to study this intermarket technical analysis. I think it's good to study the relationship between interest rates and stocks. But you've got to realize two things. One, long lead and lag cycles. And number two, it only matters when it matters. For about 20 years ago, I was involved with a hedge fund, and we could pretty much – look at stocks and in some other markets and kind of figure out where bonds were headed. Well, as the years progressed, it became harder and harder using that type of analysis. And then I later figured out that it really only mattered when it mattered. So if the market begins to focus and obsess on interest rates, then it's going to put some pressure in stocks. Now, let's just take a look at... I don't know if it's the best proxy to world for interest rates, but I always like to look at the TLT. Now, what does the TLT say? Well, if bonds go up, what does that mean? It means rates go down. When bonds go down, that means rates go up. Now, that is, that is a truly pure inverse relationship. Well, if you take a look at bonds... And let's just throw some bow ties in here for S and G's. Well, they're a little sloppy, but you can see that off of major lows, what do we have? We got a bow tie. So over the short term, rates are not rising. Bonds are rising, so rates are going down. Okay. And again, it only matters when it matters. Now back here. The bonds were dropping, and I don't remember what stocks were doing, but let's put stocks in here just for SGs. I guess I got to watch. I don't curse because I noticed that YouTube demonetized some of my videos because I occasionally say the S word. <laughs> let's see. How do, I, how do I put a – it's been so long since I've done this. There's a way to put a comparison symbol in here. Oh, here we go. So let's put the S&P 500. Let's overlay that on the chart. And let's make it like a cyan or something. Make it really st stick out. 
And let's, I think you also have to make it visible, which is stupid, but I don't know why. Why would you plot something invisible? Okay, so doing this type of analysis, and again, don't get too caught up in this type of analysis, but you can see that, yes, back here, bonds were dropping, and then what happened? Eventually, stocks caught up and started dropping too. But in more recent times, bonds were headed higher, and what's happening too? Stocks are headed higher too. So play with all this intermarket technical analysis. Do read the book. Get it off my website. I'll make a dollar or 35 cents. I forget how much. It won't be much, but I'll make a little bit, and I'll put that back into the management fees for the website. But you can see here, going back longer term in your intermarket technical analysis, well, stocks imploded here, and really bonds were doing, weren't doing that bad, and then bonds took off, probably a flight for safety. And then eventually, bonds peaked. What happened? Stocks bottom. Okay. And then bonds peaked way back here. I guess they peaked again here and here. And then what have stocks done in between? Mostly headed higher. So it's pretty hard to time a market, at least in present times, based on the bond market. So I wouldn't get too excited about that longer term economic view or and or try to time stocks off of bonds. And I don't know where the charts are. Hopefully they'll catch up. Anyway, uh, since we there is a lag, feel free to start asking about individual issues. And I'll go ahead and cover the market and some sector action here. Now, today we're having a really good day so far. I know, day ain't over yet. But the good news is we're pushing back towards these prior peaks in here or the S&P 500. I would really like to see it go on to make new highs. Now, there wasn't enough time today, but I did get to ask a question on market timing. I would encourage you to go in and watch the more recent videos I did, I've done on daylight and also pay attention to the net-net price game. And net-net, you just simply draw a line, a horizontal line on your chart. And if the market hasn't made a lot of progress in quite a while, then you know that A, it's going sideways because you can plainly see the arrow, which you will in a few minutes if this charts ever catch up. And B, it's just you can look at the price today and go back in time, look at the price and see where it was. And so you need to be very selective when the market is going sideways. The good news is the S&P 500, and just in case the charts won't catch up, is right around 2800 right now it's 2792 to be exact and then the old highs are 2850 round number so we're about 50 points maybe 60 points away from breaking out to all-time highs as a general statement i like to err on the side of the longer term trend now if i measure that out for you i'll tell you exactly how much further we're less than three percent away from all-time highs so that's certainly a good thing. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. And you're going to see it in about three minutes. <laughs> NASDAQ's having a decent day. It's up about 1%. And guess what? No, not chicken butt. If it closes where it is now at 7792, that would be an all time closing high. As a trend guy, I'm not going to worry about the market too much as long as it's banging out new highs. I'm just going to follow along. Russell 2000 has begun to lag a little lately. It's only up a smidge today, but it recently rallied nicely out of a pullback and it almost made it to all time highs. I wish, and I know wish in one hand and, uh, or was it hope in one hand and you know what the other, I don't want to get kicked off of YouTube again, but I, would have hoped that it would have gone, or I wish it would go up to do highs and stay there. And so far, it hasn't done that, but it did rally nicely out of the pullback. Almost textbook in nature. Now, let's take a look at a few other areas in here. 
Energy's got whacked pretty hard here. I think crude was whacked pretty hard yesterday. You can see right here, crude sold off. If you look at the USO, was down 5% yesterday. So that put a little pressure on the energy stocks. Metals and mining also got whacked pretty hard. Metals and mining is down here towards multi-month lows. So I don't see any reason to do anything with metals and mining. Banks, insurance, financials in general, big cap stocks, and maybe they're anticipating those. Well, actually, higher interest rates would be good for banks, but I don't know why they're headed lower, but they're lower, headed lower. So in general, the big cap stocks are underperforming. And look no further than the Russell 2000, just off of all-time highs. NASDAQ, right at all-time highs, which represent smaller cap and technology stocks, respectively. That's why those smaller cap, more inefficient type of markets, as a general statement, are doing better than these more brick and mortar type of areas, such as manufacturing, materials of construction, et cetera. Literally brick and mortar companies in some cases. Transports, looking a little questionable in here. Sharp sell off yesterday. Nice little bounce today, though. But as a general statement, it looks like they have rolled over. And again, as a general statement, your big cap areas are really underperforming right now, which is okay because we like the more inefficient smaller cap issues anyway. Now, I know with the lag, it's going to be a pain in the butt, but if there's any individual stocks you want to talk about, let me know now, and I'll be happy to pull those up for you. And again, the recordings are very robust, so if you're watching recording this, you're wondering, probably wondering why we're talking so much about the lag. All right, any questions, individual stocks? All right, here we go. Five-year Treasury FVX below 1% in 2016, now 2.6. That's rising rates. Okay, so what you're saying is a short end of the curve. All right, that's true. I'll give you that. The short end of the curve. I wonder if that's on here, FVX. Is there a way to get five-year rates on here? What's the short? What's this uh, short-term rate? Let's see if I can get something to come up. Pro shares, equities for rising rates. Nope. Let's see. Five year. Let's try five year. Nope. F. Try FVX. FVX. Nope. Yeah, I don't doubt. Here we go. Okay, here's your yield. Okay, so you're saying that the yield has gone up on the short end. Yeah, okay, I'll give you that. Um, and maybe that could put some pressure on stocks, but again, there's going to be a long lead and lag cycle. Let's let's try a little trick we did earlier. Let's put the S&P in here. Yeah, I didn't mean to chastise you or anything. The point is that based on the 30-year, which I like to look at for interest rates, uh, I really, really not that worried about interest rates. But yes, there are those out there. It will use green and make it visible. There are those out there that are very concerned that we could invert on the yield curve. And they're doing a lot of other serious, serious analysis with rates and things like that and yield curve analysis and all. I don't really get into all of that. I think for me, I could end up with analysis paralysis. It's much easier for me to just draw arrows on charts and try to get into trend on those charts and not try to play long-term economists. Okay, what's the old saying? An economist will tell you tomorrow why what he predicted yesterday didn't come true today. And you'll see that happen quite often. But getting back to the lead and lag, well, what happened here? Rates went up for a long, long time. Well, all right, let's short stocks, okay? Let's short stocks here. This is the S&P 500 because, well, let's short them here. Let's short them here because rates are going up. Well, what happened? It took a long time before that market corrected, okay? 
and then now stocks are going back up. So you might end up with a market where you have rising rates, whether short term or long term, in rising stocks. So I wouldn't get too caught up in that, but I hear you. I guess that's pretty scary based on what you're saying, that we went from 1% to 2.6% on the short end of the curve. Uh, in some ways, that might, be, that might be a positive development. Wouldn't that mean there's some uh, demand for money or something? Okay, Phil wants to know about IQ. I'm long IQ, FYI, on an S&G type of trade. Okay, um, I am juggling, juggling some accounts around, and I wanted to see if the account was actually live, and I actually placed a trade on IQ yesterday. Full disclosure. Uh, I'm, my God, this is the best looking stock I've ever seen in my life. You should you should sell your house and put all your money into the stock. No, um, this is one that's been on a Landry list quite a bit as of late. Very dangerous stock. OK, so consider yourself warned. But it did make this first deep retracement. I'm not a huge fan of Fibonacci. Let's just even see if it is some Fibonacci first. Uh, but in these IPOs, sometimes you get these first deep retracements, and they can be pretty cool. And if you go back and look at my first book, I did kind of hint at that pattern in IPOs because you have a well-defined low and a well-defined high. Now, I'm not actually trading the Fibonacci in and of itself. I'm eyeballing it, and I'm trading that first deep retracement in IPOs, okay? So... Yeah, I do like uh, this stock, but it's very, 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 very volatile, and it'd be a fairly dangerous trade to take, okay? In IPOs, ideally, you want to try to get in for one of those, uh, what I call the pioneer type of setup. So in a case like this, you would be looking to get in at a new closing high, possibly with also something like the Dave Light pattern where the low is greater than the moving average, okay? But yeah, uh, so far so good on that. Looks like it's trying to rally out of that retracement. Just be darn, make darn sure you're very careful and have a stop. Risk, strategy, scan for strategy. Okay, I'm not sure what you're saying, but yes. Always know what your risk are. Twilio, I think we have on the Landry list, but I'll, I'll pull it up because I'm not recommending it as a short. No, it's not. I'm sorry. I must be having confused. My problem with Twilio now is that it made this big gap higher, okay? I like to see stocks accelerate higher. It kind of made this gap higher and then kind of went sideways, drifted higher, and now it's trying to make new highs again. I think I would try to find something else like an IPO or something that's just taken off and pulling back like this or even even better, a pioneer pattern way back here. Okay, So I think I would hold off on that one. BX at 32. BX, never heard of it. Uh, oh, yeah, it's Blackstone Asset Management. Well, there's a big thick stock for you, okay? Are fairly thick. What's that? 40, 44 million shares on average. It looks like an electric cardiogram. It's all over the place. So there's no reason why I would get too excited about a stock like this. Okay, HV of 17. What's the overall market basis of the spiders now? 10. So it's pretty low in volatility. I think that you could possibly go after something a little bit more exciting, something a little bit more E inefficient. Okay. Now earlier I, I hinted upon trading these inefficient stocks. If you look at my website, if you look at GoGo Nomo, you'll see where I talked about where you want to do just the opposite on the short side that you would do on the long side. On the long side, you want to trade more exciting stocks, IPOs, biotechs, etc that have the potential to make these big inefficient moves. On the short side, as a general statement, I prefer something a little bit more stodgy that's rolling over from high levels. And if you read, again, the go, go, no, mo, you'll be up to speed on that. You'll know as much as I do. KHC you bought at 58 for John, okay? Okay, uh, well, foods aren't doing so hot right now. And 
let's see what you did. HV is kind of low on that. Now, I don't want to pick you up, pick it apart, beat you up too much, John, because everybody's got their own way of doing things. I just prefer to trade. Yeah, look at the volume in this crazy volume. This is Kraft Heinz. Well, everybody's heard of Kraft and everybody's heard of Heinz. That's going to be a more efficient type of stock. Volatility pretty low at 23. But I hear you. It looks like it's bottomed out. It's made a bow tie. I just would look go after something with a little bit more opportunity. But, yeah, it's coming off of all-time highs, and then you would have had an entry right around here. Again, I think you could have found – you could find something maybe a little bit better. Now, in a stock like this, you'd look to – I'd prefer shorting it, actually, at very high levels with something like a bow tie. But it's been pretty choppy even on the short side, as you can see. But, yeah, it's not horrible. It's just not something that I would particularly go after. So it's a matter of personal preference, okay? All right, any more? I do have a schedule to keep. Uh, to I happen to have a schedule today. So if you guys want to get them in quickly, we can do that. I'll try to get as many as I can. If not, while I'm an impasse, let me just get out the way. I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your appearance and by your presence. T-N-D-M, T-N-D-M. Yeah, this is a stock that's obviously in a longer term, uh, nice uptrend, uh, but very longer term. It's still at fairly low levels. I'm not crazy about this gap down here, but I guess if it went up 100% from here, that'd be a good problem to have. It's not set up particularly right now, but if it continues higher, maybe on a pullback, that might be worth a while. You're the best. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> I guess I can't. I was going to make a joke. Thanks, Mom. I guess I can't make that joke anymore. Womp, womp. Uh, <laughs> any more real quick? We'll have to keep them crying, literally. All right. Uh, going once, going twice. Well, again, thanks, everybody, for coming. And hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls. Oh, maybe not next week, week after. We might not do a show next week because I'm going to be participating in the Wealth 365 presentation, which is a pretty massive deal. Click on my website homepage. I'm just amazed that they're able to get about 80 of us guys together to make these presentations, and they're all free. So check that out if you get a chance. I appreciate that um, and looking forward to seeing you there. So that'll be next Thursday. And, again, I don't know if I'll actually be, uh, be doing a, a show. I might be busy preparing for that. So Next Thursday, Thursday, one way or the other, I will be doing a webinar either for those guys or back here at the Weekend Charts. Again, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thanks again, and I guess we'll see you guys next Thursday one way or the other. Thank you so much.